All right, everybody, I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon to this week's uh, NREM seminar. That's Natural Resources, Ecology, and Management. Um, we've uh, co-sponsored this event with the MFA program of the Creative Writing in the Environment. So big thanks to uh, that program, Mary Swander and Deb Markhart for, uh, for the treats, which are en route. I <laughs> should be here, I, I hope. Um, they promised me. Um, I'd like to introduce to you John Price. Uh, he's a writer from, uh, he lives in Council Bluffs now, teaches at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. He is born and raised in Iowa, from Fort Dodge, Iowa. Um, did his undergraduate and his MFA and PhD at the University of Iowa, and he was at the writer's workshop there. Um, has a se several books out, one of which is available here is his, his new one. Um, in the tradition of NRAM seminars, uh, to, we like to get to know our speakers a little bit. So we're going to play a game I call Two Lies and a tr or Two Truths and a Lie. I'm going to read you three facts about Mr. Price, and one, only one of which is true. And so I'd like you guys to try to identify the uh, non-truth uh, that I'm reading. So number one, Mr. Price has the image of a bison tattooed on his shoulder. While in Idaho on his honeymoon, Mr. Price was climbing a cliffside and got scared or stuck halfway up and had to be talked back down by his wife. And Mr. Price was once featured in a column by Dave Barry who uh, expounded on this story of, of a man being killed by a pheasant. So there's, there's three facts. Would anybody like to hazard a guess as to which one of those is not true? Cheese man. The third one. We have a vote for the third one not being true. Anyone else? The first one. In fact, uh, it is the third one. Dave Barry has not written, to our knowledge, written a column about, about Mr. Price. So with that, let's welcome him up here. Thanks, Devin. Actually, a little bit of a follow-up on the Dave Barry thing. Um, he did write a column about someone almost getting killed by a wild bird, but it was about someone on that same stretch of highway, which I'm about to read about, read, uh, Highway 30 there outside of Cedar Rapids. Um, he was driving down the, the road in a pickup, and a wild turkey flew in his window. And he had his daughter in the car, and they flipped. Everyone was okay, ultimately, good, good thing, but he wrote a big column about this... Uh, person almost getting killed by a wild turkey, and I felt kind of ripped off. You know, like my pheasant story wasn't somehow good enough for Dave Barry. It had to be a wild turkey, so. Um, I want to thank Devin especially for, for hosting and getting this event going to, uh, today. Uh, this is the f f Friday before spring break, and I want to appreciate everyone showing up today for, uh, for the reading. I also want to thank the Department of Natural Resources and uh, Resource Ecology and Management as well as the English Department and the Creative Writing Department and the Committee on Lectures. Thank you for, for making this possible. Also, I, I have a little bug today, so if, if you have trouble hearing me at all, let me, let me know. So, um, This is actually my first official reading of, from the book Man Killed by Pheasant, and I'm, I'm very pleased that it's, that it's here at Iowa State for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the, the dedication that Iowa State has towards interdisciplinarity. And the fact that this reading was sponsored by the humanities and by the sciences, I think, is evidence of that. Also, I was here for uh, a year as a visiting assistant professor back in the 90s. And uh, I became aware of this sort of interdisciplinary nature of, of this university then, too, as well. I was hired to teach technical writing and nonfiction writing. And I could handle the nonfiction writing well enough. Uh, that was my area of specialty. The technical writing was... Um, a little bit of a stretch. Uh, my technical knowledge was a bit limited back then, and I, for about three months, I was able to kind of fake it. Uh, and then the students were giving their uh, their presentations, and one student gave a, a talk on um, a factory, I believe, in Iowa that produces church pews. And so it left me in this kind of, a, I guess, in a religious frame of mind. And the second. Uh, presenter got up and she was going to talk about uh, wafer production at the University of Notre Dame. And I said, oh, wow, this is, that'll be very exciting. I've always wondered where those communion wafers were made. 
and there was this dead silence in the classroom and there until this voice in the back said oh my god and one student leaned forward and said dr price they're talking about computer chip wafers <laughs> so the jig was up at that point and i knew that i was going to have to get beyond uh, my safe zone as a writer and as a teacher to to teach successfully here at iowa state and that interdisciplinary aspect, I think, has infected my work in a positive way ever since then. I'm also uh, happy to be reading here today because of a friendship I had with Kurt Moody. Some of you may know him or know his name here at Iowa State. He was an undergraduate here. I met him at the University of Iowa when he was at, in the writer's program, the grad program there. Uh, we lived together in a boarding house. and I was an undergraduate at the time, and he was my first... Uh, writing friend, uh, someone who took writing seriously, not just as a vocation, but as a way of life. And uh, I don't think I would have been a writer without him. He uh, left Iowa to go to California to be a screenplay writer, and unfortunately he was murdered out there during a, a botched attempt to steal his car. And I think there is now a scholarship in the creative writing program in, in his name. So um, I think he would he would be pleased that my first rating here was at Iowa State. We drove back every year for Visha together and uh, that annual pilgrimage and he was very proud about of being from this from this university so I read today in, in his honor to some extent so um, this is a memoir and I think memoirs are about in part tracing the sources of our ethical lives our values the way we look at the world in the situation of in the case of this book I'm looking at sort of tracing the sources of my relationship to place, to the natural world. And a lot of it is spent uh, t in childhood, tracing those sources back to my early encounters with nature through pets, through uh, those smaller uh, places of wildness in my neighborhood and in my community. Um, but one event in particular uh, occurred later on when I was in grad school. Uh, and this was in the area of Belle Plaine. And it's the title piece from the book, Man Killed by Pheasant. I'll start off by reading this, and then I'll read a little bit from the ending. So I'm driving east on Highway 30 from our new home in Belle Plaine to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's a four-lane, and because I'm an eldest child, I'm driving the speed limit, around 55, 60 miles an hour. I'm listening to Jimi Hendrix cry Mary, Imagining, as usual, that I am Jimi Hendrix, when in the far distance I see some brown blobs hovering across the highway, one, then two. By the way they move, low, low and slow, I suspect they're young pheasants. As I near the place that they're crossing, I look over the empty passenger seat into the grassy ditch to see if I can spot the whole clan. Suddenly there is a peripheral darkness, the fast shadow of an eclipse, and something explodes against the side of my head in a fury of flapping and scratching and squawking. In an act of extraordinary timing, one of the straggling pheasants has flown in my driver's side window, and being the steel-jawed action hero I am, I scream. I scream like a rabbit and strike at it frantically with my left arm, the car swerving, wings snapping, Hendrix wailing, feathers beating at my face until at last I knock the thing back out the window and onto the road. I regain control of the car, if not myself, and pull over to cry. That's the time I should have been killed by a pheasant. For reasons peculiar to that summer, I recall it often. It occurred, for one, while I was on my way to teach a technical writing course at a nearby community college, a summer job to help me through grad school. This distance learning experience took place exclusively by radio waves, with me in an empty room on campus and my 15 students scattered at sites within a 100-mile radius. The technology was such that my students could see me, but I couldn't see them. To converse, we had to push buttons at the base of our microphones so that each class felt like an episode of Larry King Live. Judy from Monticello, hello, you're on the air. The future of higher education, my supervisor called it. And I never did get the hang of the camera. I'd turn it on at the beginning of class, and there on the big screen monitor would be a super close-up of my lips. 
I'd spend the next few minutes jostling the joystick, zooming in and out like one of those early music videos, until I found the suitable frame. Sometimes my students would laugh at this, and I'd hear them laughing, but only if they pushed their buttons. If there was an electrical storm nearby, I wouldn't hear them at all. On the way to such a displaced, bodiless job, a near-death experience had some additional currency, as did the larger natural disaster unfolding around me. It was the summer of the great Iowa floods, 1993, and the reason I was on Highway 30 to begin with was that my usual route to campus had been washed out by the swollen Iowa River. This was a serious situation. People had been killed, and Des Moines had been without water for over a week. Nature gone mad was how the national media described it. Although aware of the widespread suffering, I was privileged to watch the whole thing unfold more gently from the roadways of my rural commutes. And what I saw was a wilderness of birds. Bean fields suddenly became sheer, inaccessible places where herons stood piercing frogs in the shallows, where pelicans flew in great cyclonic towers. Perched on soggy, neglected fence posts were birds I hadn't seen since early childhood, bobolinks and bluebirds and tanagers. Their color and song drew my eye closer to the earth, to the ragged ditches full of forgotten wildflowers and grasses, safe at last, at least for a while, from the mower's blade. The domesticated landscape of my home had gone wild, and I was mesmerized by it. Toward the end of the summer flooding, when the dramatic presence of wild birds dwindled, I thought a lot about Noah, about those end days on the ark between the release of the raven and the return of the dove, between knowledge of a decimated landscape and faith in one that, through decimation, had become reborn. When it was all over, I thought I understood Noah's first impulse once on dry land to get drunk and forget. I'd lived my entire life in Iowa, the most ecologically altered state in the Union, with less than one-tenth of one percent of its native habitats remaining. Tragic is what the ecologist Wes Jackson has called the plowing up of this prairie region, one of the two or three worst atrocities committed by Americans. Not that I'd ever cared. It's hard to care about a wild place you've never seen or known. Yet in those short flooded months of 1993, I witnessed a blurry reflection of what the land had once been, a rich ecology of wetlands and savannas and prairies, alive with movement and migration, alive with power. Under its influence, I felt closer to my home landscape than ever before. So when that power slipped from view, I was surprised to find myself longing to chase after it. Having spent most of my life wanting to live the, leave the Midwest, where might I find the reasons to stay, to commit? Death by pheasant didn't immediately come to mind. Although in the wake of the floods, death was part of what I longed for, or rather the possibility of a certain kind of death, the kind in which you become lost in a vast landscape and die, as Edward Abbey has described it, alone, on rock, under sun, at the brink of the unknown, like a wolf, like a great bird. This had nearly been my fate on that cliff in Idaho during my honeymoon. And in my mind, it had helped, def helped define what wilderness, uh, that wilderness as a, uh, as a place worthy of respect, a place of consequence, and a kind of fearful freedom. My German friend Elmar calls this freedom Vogelfrei, which loosely translates into free as a bird. Far from the positive spin we've put on this phrase, Vogelfrei refers to the state of being cast out from the tribe, so free you'll die in the open, unburied to be picked apart by birds. It's a state of fear and vulnerability and movement, one that might especially, here in the agricultural Midwest, a place seemingly without fang or claw or talon, make us more attentive to the natural world, more humbled by its power to transform us. At first flush, my collision with the pheasant didn't seem to hold that kind of possibility, but it could have. If, for example, this had happened to me as a child or adolescent or as a member of a New Age men's group, I might have made something more of it. When I was a boy, some of my favorite comic book characters were mutations of man and animal, Mole Man and Spider Man and Captain America's ally, the Falcon. 
Imagine the comic book story that could have developed this time. A mild-mannered English professor is struck in the head by a wayward pheasant, his blood mingling with the birds, while coincidentally a cosmic tsunami from a distant stellar explosion soaks the whole scene in gamma radiation. Emerging from the smoldering rubble, pheasant man. No, super pheasant man. As super pheasant man, our mild-mannered professor finds he has acquired the bird's more powerful features. Learning to use its pride and daring, its resilience, its colorful head feathers. Learning to use them for the good of humanity while at the same time fighting the darker side of his condition. Namely, a propensity for polygamy and loose stools. But I was not a boy when I met that unlucky pheasant on Highway 30, which is too bad because for a long time afterward I found nothing particularly uplifting about the experience. Instead, I saw my life and death made a joke. Imagine the regional headlines. Man killed by pheasant, mother files for hunting license. <laughs> Imagine the funeral where in the middle of I'll fly away, one of my more successful cousins whispers to his wife, you know, it wasn't even a cock pheasant that killed him. It was just a little baby pheasant. Imem imagine members of that hypothetical men's group who in their wailful mourning of my death botch up the spirit animal ritual and condemn my soul to be born not on the wings of an eagle or a falcon, but on those of a pheasant stubby and insufficient, struggling to get us both off the ground, never getting more than maybe 15 feet toward heaven before dropping back down to earth with a thud and a cluck. No, thank you. I do not wish to become one with the pheasant in this life or in the next. Yet seen through the history of the land, this bird and I have been colliding for centuries. Having evolved together on the grasslands of distant continents, we were both brought to this country by the accidents of, te of nature and technology and desire. As Americans, the pheasant and I have come to share certain important historical figures, like Benjamin Franklin, whose son-in-law was one of the first to attempt to introduce the ringneck pheasant, a native of China, to this country, an unsuccessful release in New Jersey. Its introduction to Iowa over a century later was by accident, taking place during a 1901 windstorm near Cedar Falls that blew down confinement fences and released 2,000 of the birds into the prairie night. They've remained here ever since, sharing with my people an affinity for the northern plains to which we've both become anchored by the peculiarities of the soil. This soil, lus and glacial till, is migrant and invasive like us, having been carried here from ancient Canada by wind and by ice, its rich organic loam, black as oil, brought my farmer ancestors to the region and has, at the same time, held close the range of the ringneck pheasant, lacing the bird's grit with calcium carbonate. Because the ringneck neck requires an abundance of this mineral, it doesn't stray far, not even a few hundred miles south into the gray prairies of, say, lower Illinois. So the pheasant and I have remained settlers in this region, watching as others of our kind move on. As such, as we have, we have come to share some of the same enemies, like the fence row to fence row, get big or get out agricultural policies of the 1970s and 80s. These policies enacting yet another vision of migration dramatically expanded agricultural exports and at the same time led the region to the farm crisis of the 1980s, to the flight and impoverishment and death of thousands of industrial and farm families. For the pheasant as well, despite set-aside programs, this fence row to fence row world has held its own kind of impoverishment, a destruction of habitats so thorough that 200 pheasants have been known to crowd a shelter belt only 100 yar yards long. In such a bare, naked world, a good blizzard like the one in 1975 has the power to wipe out 80% of a local pheasant population in a single evening. Yet in sharing enemies, we have also been together the common enemy. To the prairie chicken, for instance, one of the many native citizen, citizens that had the unfortunate luck to precede us here in the heartland. For almost a century, European settlers hunted and plowed down prairie chicken populations in Iowa. But the ring-necked pheasant also played a role, destroying the prairie chicken's eggs, occupying its nests, and interrupting, seemingly out of spite, its dancing ground rituals. 
Some argue that restoring prairie chicken populations will have to coincide with significant reductions in prairie populations. Reducing pheasant numbers around here, however, is about as easy and popular as reducing our own. The difficulties in part are economic. In Iowa, we hunt and eat this bird to the tune of about a million and a half a year. It's one of our biggest tourist attractions. But I wonder, too, if we don't see in this bird, at some unconscious level, a dark reflection of our own troubling history in the American grasslands, our role as ecological party crashers, as culture wreckers, our role ultimately as killers and thieves. To question the pheasant's claim on the land is in some way to question our own. It's unfair, of course, and dangerous to project our sins onto another species. When tossing around ethical responsibility, the difference between us between instinct and intent is significant, but the pheasants needn't worry about taking the blame. Hardly anyone around here gives them a second thought. That indifference was part of my problem when I finally began searching while living in Belle Plain for reasons to care about my home landscape. In relation to that bird, as to most of the familiar transplanted wildlife around me, I felt nothing. The pheasant was common, and the last thing I wanted to feel as a Midwesterner was common. Since early adolescence, I'd been fleeing a sense of inadequacy shared by many in this region, a sense of self marked, as Minnesotan Patricia Hampel has said, by an indelible brand of innocence, which is to be marked by an absence of vacancy, by nothing at all. For Midwesterners like me, the complex, the worthy, seemed always to be found elsewhere, not here in this ordinary place, this ordinary life. Not surprisingly, in the years immediately following the floods, I didn't seek that new relationship to the Midwest and the familiar land immediately around me, but by traveling to distant and, in my imagination, more exotic landscapes, such as the Black Hills and Badlands in western South Dakota. What I discovered in those places did indeed transform me. Near Wind Cave, I saw for the first time elk bugling and mating at home on their native prairies. While sitting in a fly-plagued prairie dog town, I saw for the first time a bison bull wallowing in the brown dust. On the grasslands near Bear Butte, where Crazy Horse once sought vision, I saw for the first time a falcon stoop to kill a duck, the native cycles of predator and prey, of wild death still lingering. Even Vogelfry, that fearful freedom. I felt it for the first time in this region while walking lost in the deep earth of the Badlands. My journey through these places toward commitment has been awkward, fragmented, and at times pathetic, even comic. Yet the significance of those experiences cannot be underestimated. How they have worked to cure a lifetime of ignorance and indifference. How, to use spiritual terms, they have filled what once was empty. But if the spiritual journey to, place, to a place begins, as some claim, with mortal fear then it was not the bison or the falcon or the badlands that first drew me closer to the region in which I had been raised. It was the pheasant, that particular baby pheasant, there on a highway in eastern Iowa, which almost, as my sister Allison would say, rocked my world. In a sense, that's exactly what it did. It made me wake up, become more observant of what's lurking in the margins, and what's lurking there, despite the rumors, is the possibility of surprise, of accident, of death. And if it's possible in this overdetermined landscape for a pheasant to kill a man, then why not also the possibility of restoration, renewal, and at last hope? That's a romantic stretch, I know, and at the time of the incident itself, I didn't feel particularly worshipful of its surprise. As I sat in the car wiping my face, I just felt lucky. Thank God it wasn't a two-lane. And then ridiculous. The whole thing was so absurd it might have been a dream. I carefully leaned my head out the window to see if the pheasant was still on the road. It wasn't. I thought about going back to see if it was injured, but decided against it. After all, it was only a pheasant. Besides, I was late for work, where in a few minutes I would be taking my own precarious flight through the airwaves across the flooded land, to students I would never see, never truly know. I started the car and eased back onto the highway. 
As I approached cruising speed, I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. I jerked, swerved the car a little. A feather. An ordinary brown feather. Then another and another. There must have been a dozen, floating in the breeze of the open window. They tickled and annoyed me. Yet for reasons I still can't explain, I kept the window open, just a crack, enough to keep the feathers dancing about the cabin. And that's how I, the man almost killed by a pheasant, drove the rest of those miles, touched by its feathers in flight, touched by an intimacy as rare and welcome in my tragic country as laughter in a storm. I'll skip ahead here a little bit to the end of the book. The final chapter takes place on uh, Calso Prairie. And some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, it's a 160-acre preserve uh, near, near Fort Dodge. and uh, Well, it's closer to Manson, Iowa. But um, it's one of those places that I, it was one of those treasures that was so close to home that I didn't know about and didn't appreciate growing up. I had read about it in the works of John Madsen, and some of you may be familiar with, with his work. Uh, uh, he's one of my inspirations. He's an Iowan, wrote about Calso Prairie as one of his place, favorite places to go. I uh, visited there for the first time this last summer. I took my two kids with me and my wife, Stephanie. Uh, my sons were, uh, at the time, six and four years old, and I wanted to foster in them uh, a connection to the prairie uh, early on in their lives. Uh, the other reason I went there was because it was near the place where my great-grandmother, uh, Tilly, who was a Swedish immigrant, came over when she was 21 years old alone, was likely, uh, it was likely around that area at a, at a train junction called Terra that she got her first look at the Iowa landscape. She plays kind of an important role in my, in my book because I see in her a kind of kindred spirit. She's someone who traveled here uh, from far away and you know, saw Iowa at least initially as a kind of disappointment of some of the expectations that she had for uh, America. She was told that the streets were paved in gold and this was something she literally believed, uh, as my, her daughter, my great aunt Esther, told me. Um, she also was a seamstress in Sweden. Uh, which was uh, actually a, a pretty prestigious position where she came from. And when she came over here, um, she basically became a house servant for about $2 a, a week. It also was a place that, that um, took from her her language and her culture, uh, which is something she clung to fiercely. And um, it was a place, again, that um, disappointed her in a lot of regards. She never did make it back, back home to Sweden. But I often wonder... Uh, about what the natural world uh, held for her. And this is something that there are no stories about. My great aunt doesn't know what her relationship or attitude was toward uh, the natural world, although her husband, my great-grandfather John, was very much a nature lover, and they used to take walks in the woods of Fort Dodge and uh, collect walnuts and gooseberries and so forth. So that's I wanted to talk about that a little bit as a setup here. That, so I'm going back to this place where she was, it was likely she got her f first glimpse at Iowa. Also, a little bit about my sons. As some of you know, when you take children to natural areas, you're expecting maybe a kind of blissed-out experience where they're connecting and having this wonderful... Well, it quickly erupted into violence. My youngest, uh, Spencer, had picked up uh, a piece of grass and proclaimed himself king of the sky and then whipped his older brother with it, Ben. And so um, I'm kind of picking it up at, at that point. Ben lets out another wail. He hit me. The king of the sky is struck again, this time with a stalk of rattlesnake master. Have you seen these things? They're like maces. It did some serious damage. Spencer has had a rough week. Last Wednesday he was grounded or separated, as he calls it, for clawing one of neighbor Todd's four children. He plays a little bit of a role in this book. We have temporarily banned him from playing at their house with its massive play set and terraced front yard until he, demonstrate, he demonstrates he can act civilized. This latest incident has not helped his cause, and he knows it. He marches off defiantly into the deep grass and dis disappears. 
Seeking sanctuary in nature is nothing unusual for Spencer. Many times we've found him completely naked in the woods out back or in a tree or in the prairie garden out front. He's proven more willing than the rest of us to risk intimacy with the natural world, which sometimes leads to trouble. Poison ivy, splinters, wasp stings, rocks dropped on toes. Other times, though, he's led us to amazing discoveries. Not just the usual earthworms and roly-poly colonies hidden under beneath rocks, but also a woodchuck burrow, a newborn fawn, a hawk's nest, a log full of squirming red-bellied snakes. He has discovered injured birds and squirrels and butterflies, which we have done our best to nurse back to health or provide with a decent funeral. When we let him explore, naked or otherwise, chances are he will lead us to some new astonishment or responsibility we hadn't guessed was so close by. It takes me a while to spot the crown of Spencer's blonde head nearly hidden in a thicket of sloth grass. I'm unsure what, if anything, I can say about his behavior that will be helpful, so I talk about the grass instead. I congratulate him on choosing an amazing species to hide in, telling him that sloth grass loves water more than any other prairie grass and is the fastest growing, sometimes reaching nine feet. To illustrate, I raise my hand as far as possible above my head. He turns to look, so I pull out all the stops, exclaiming how sloth grass likes to hang out along the boggy potholes left over from when a glacier, a ginormous river of ice, way taller than our house, melted thousands of years ago. I tell him that this whole area was full of these potholes, inspiring one settler to name the nearby town of Moorland after the Scottish Moors. At this last detail, he glazes over. But I continue bravely. Did you know, Spence, that the pioneers used to call this grass black grass because of its deep green color? and also because it marked wet places where their wagons might get stuck, the way our car did last spring in the mud hole at the end of the drive, remember? That's when you use the F word. I ignore this and invite him to dig his hand into the sod at the base of the grass, denser even than the blue stems, and to my surprise he does. I tell him that the pioneers thought it was the best thing for building sod houses and that many prairie Indians thought the leaves were the best thing for thatching the roofs on their lodges to keep the rain and snow from falling on their heads. I tell him that this place where the glacier melted, where the sloth glass grows, where his ancestors settled, where his father was raised, is the youngest of all kinds of land in Iowa, and as he is at just as he is the youngest in our family, and is the best place to grow things. The best place to grow up, he asks. I pause to consider the question. Ah! That's a very bad imitation of my son's scream, I'm sorry. Spencer charges out of the thicket, crying and holding his hand. The grass cut me! The grass cut me and it's bleeding! Steph and Ben run over and we examine the wound, a fine cut at the base of the thumb. Nothing major, but a bleeder nonetheless. Don't touch it! Spencer screams. I tell Steph that I forgot to warn him that the, about the serrated edges of the sloth grass, the reason the farmers call it rip gut. How could you forget that? Ben chimes in, apparently forgetting the fresh welts on his back. He's little and he doesn't know any better. Yeah, I'm little, Spencer sobs, and you should have told me. It's your fault and you need to get separated. Now, now, Spence, I say, trying to redeem the situation. Look at it this way. You've become blood brothers with the prairie. I don't want to be blood brothers with the prairie. I just want it to stop hurting, and I want you to get separated. Steph gives me a sympathetic look that also suggests that I should wander off for a moment while she calms Spencer down. So that's exactly what I do. As I walk, I spot several familiar grasses and flowers from that first flooded summer in Belle Plaine. I notice, noticed many of them during the drive here as well, along the roadsides on the outskirts of Fort Dodge, which were lush and beautiful. Local citizens have been restoring those roadsides to native prairie, I hear, and I wonder how that effort has influenced the younger generation's relationship to home, if at all. Do they yearn as much as I did to leave, to experience more grandeur, more wildness? I feel it even now on this prairie, which is nothing close to some of the others I've seen, with their thousands of acres of native grass teeming with wildlife. This place is so quiet, so small. 
Then again, why do I presume that a prairie, unlike a mountain, an ocean, or a human life, will roll out the entirety of its secrets for me after neglecting it for a lifetime? I, work f I walk farther into deeper grass, and here's something, a soft, rhythmic clucking, pheasants. What is it with me and these birds? I believe they may, may be following me, the way the crocodile followed Captain Hook. So I retreat to the top of a Mima mound. I think that's how you pronounce that. There, Mima or Mima? I've never quite figured it out, but Mima mound, I'll go with that. I try to spot them, but they remain hidden in the grass. They aren't going to give away any secrets either. I take the opportunity to look around because whatever else might be said about Mima mounds, they offer per perspective. These are, um, by the way, um, sort of mysterious mounds that are found. Some of you know about these in the, in the, in the prairie. Um, and John Madsen wrote about, about them quite a bit. Originally, people thought that uh, they might be Indian burial grounds, and they dug them up, and they never did discover any evidence of that. They're probably created by a combination of animal digging and frost heaves and, and other things, but um, toads by the thousands are, are, are known to hibernate in them, and uh, they're amazing sort of mysteries of the, of the prairie in a way. But um, the setting sun is, is getting ready to emerge from beneath the clouds. The storm I thought would chase us away has moved east over Fort Dodge in indistinct darkness while lightning illuminates the deep billows and folds of the clouds. Storm clouds here can reach 40,000 feet, powerful enough to tear jet liners apart, level entire towns, and also nourish this prairie, which will always welcome what the restless sky has to offer. What did such a place hold inside my great-grandmother's gaze? Esther had no story to tell about that, but maybe I do. Both of us had come to the grasslands for the first time in our 20s, both from European landscapes, across the sea and just down the road. We had both brought with us unrealistic expectations for this place and for ourselves, dreams and grievances that would perhaps never be satisfied. We had mourned lost family and felt lost ourselves, foreign, small, in need of sanctuary. We had sought solace in nature and the affection of friends and relatives, of a spouse, of God, and in language where the personal story can sometimes be elevated by song. This is the home we had come to share, where the land still displays the contrary impulses of our nature, to fly, to settle, played out in harmony. I want to believe that, like me, she saw something to hope for in that. When the sun finally emerges, the prairie erupts in bright colors, diverse textures, shadows, and depths. Steph and the boys have noticed it, too. Ben is, has his arm around Spencer's shoulder. They are looking out at a place transformed. What do they think of what has been given to them here? Will they consider the conditions of their upbringing to be limited, as I once did? I hope that the stories of those who have come before, the stories of the land itself, will give them some courage or at least make them feel less alone. I hope that wherever they live, they will someday be able to sing with confidence the old psalm, My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. Something explodes out of the grass, and I stumble back onto the ground. It's the pheasants, a half dozen of them, including a large, audaciously painted male. They fly over the heads of Stephanie and Ben, who point at them and shout, then they veer sharply, disappearing into the tall corn. There's a sudden rustling behind me. Spencer emerges from the grass, breathless from running. Did you see the pheasants, Daddy? He asks. I nod, and he plops down in my lap. He hands me a cone flower. I'm sorry I yelled at you. That's all right, I tell him, kissing the top of his head. I'm sorry I didn't warn you about the grass. That's all right, he says and holds up his hand to remind me. The wound has stopped bleeding, but it is still bright red to match the butterfly milkweed, the rose berries, the feathered mask of the pheasant, the horizon. Can I stop being separated now, he asks. Done, I say. And what about me? Can I stop being separated? 
He pauses to consider this question. Okay, he sighs, reaching back to touch my face. Why not? Thank you. I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions that folks might have and Yes. That's a great question. Thank you. You have a lot more courage than <laughs> Well, um you know, I think I'd like, I'd like to say it started when I was a child. A lot of writers say that, right, where they compulsively, they, they sort of knew they were a writer coming out of the womb. Well, I started writing in college, actually when I was in class with your mother. In graduate school, um, I began to, to be a serious writer. Um, writing wasn't necessarily something that I took to early on as a child and as an adolescent. Although um, I had, uh, you know, wonderful parents who are here t t today who, you know, surrounded me with books and I, I appreciated great literature and learned to appreciate it through them. And, but writing really didn't seem like an option for me. But then I took a class, a couple of nonfiction classes at the University of Iowa and fell in love with it. And so this actually, this, the writing for this book started about, um, well, I guess it would be what now, 12 years ago, 13 years ago? And... I wrote one of my first essays, and it was about being a nursing assistant in a hospital for um, children with dis uh, developmental disabilities. And that essay is in here, uh, and I think that was sort of the beginning. And so that would have been back in what, 19, I think about 89 or or 90. I started to to write. So it's, this book has been long and in, in developing over time. So I started writing in college. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, there are two books I'd like to, to, to write. One about going back to childhood again and looking at the ways that nature informed uh, the way I thought about the world and particularly uh, my sort of childhood spiritual life because I think this is something that's often underestimated in children. It's the complexity of their spiritual life and how it is informed by the natural world around them. I think we all know or have experienced ourselves uh, children who will find those places in nature, you know, behind the garage, right? And we had a, there was a space behind a neighbor's garage in our neighborhood that we referred to as Danger Island. And I went back to look at it and basically it was about as wide as this podium. And, you know, it was extending a little bit ways back, but... You know, we occupy that place with our, uh, with not just our imaginations, but also, I think, with our spiritual lives. So I want to go back and, and, and talk about that or explore it a little bit more. Another uh, work I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I'm just starting on, is looking at uh, my own role as a father uh, and trying to, uh, I guess, nurture uh, that, that sense of connection to nature in my own children. Uh, we had, uh, during the spring of 2006, my, grand, my maternal grandmother, who plays a, a big role in here, uh, decided that uh, she was 90, in her, in her early 90s, and she'd been on medications for a while, and, and she decided that um, she was going to stop taking those medications and, and uh, you know, live out the end of her life with, with some dignity that way. And uh, my, my sons were very close to her, and so that was a, a problem, how to talk about that with, with children. Uh, and nature provided the vocabulary for that, uh, particularly uh, my son Spencer's fascination with insects. And so we began to talk about life and mortality and, and ecology, essentially, through, through those uh, relationships to bugs, some of them rather unfortunate. <laughs> Our house uh, became overrun at one point. And, but um, I don't know where it's going. I'm sort of at the beginning of that, but that's, that's the, next, the next step. But again, same kind of approach, personal essays. Yes? I do. I love Hitchcock Park, which is just north of Council Bluffs, and the photograph for my, my first book was taken there. Um, 
one of the reasons I we moved to that area was because of the Lus Hills. I mean, it's a it's a state and national treasure, and uh, I knew virtually nothing about them until I moved moved to the area. Uh, I think some of you know the majority. I think of of native prairie is is in the uh, Iowa prairie is in the Lus Hills, I believe, what remains of it. And there's some amazing creative things going on there in, in trying to preserve that land and you know, uh, environmentalists working with private landowners and farmers, and it's, it's a truly amazing place to be. But Hitchcock Park is, is, a, is a place that's very special to me, and I go up there a lot with, with, our, with our boys. But there's also a Nature Conservancy site just south of Council Bluffs, uh, also beautiful, a lot of interesting restoration efforts going on down there. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just a treasure. Are you from that area? Or? Oh, great, great, great. <laughs> That's why I got that right. Good. Was it really? Oh, my gosh. Well, I know with the Nature Conservancy site south of there is such an interesting story. When they bought that that property, they had already agreed to sell one of those hills. And as you know, these are like 200-foot high hills uh, for landfill to a soybean factory. And they um, now, to the credit of the soybean factory, they they gave the Nature Conservancy a choice. They could say you could choose which hill we take. So they, they did a survey, and, and then they decided one over another, and uh, then that other one is gone. I mean, it's in the, the soybean factory is right across the processing factory, right across the road from it, and you just wouldn't know it's there. And Dev and I were talking about that a little bit over lunch, about how one of the challenges of being an environmentalist in Iowa is seeing what's there in the landscape, but also being aware of what isn't there, and uh, mourning that loss as well as, uh, you know, working actively to preserve and restore what, what, is, al what is already here. My wife's from Idaho, so, you know, that when you have that, that those old, old growth forest right up next to a clear cut, you know what's missing. You feel that, you feel that loss. You, you grieve it. It's a little bit more difficult here. Yeah. Oh, no. Better get a drink of water. Well, the pheasant incident seemed like one that might lend itself well to an essay. I wasn't sure what kind of essay, but um, I, I am not one of those writers. I, and I always admire those who talk about how they write every day. You know, they're up at the crack of dawn. You know, and every day they put in, you know, I just, my life doesn't lend itself well to that. And I think that's true for the majority of writers. Uh, so I write when I can, and that's sometimes every day and it's sometimes every other day. And I do sit down and, and you know, one of the, I think the challenges of being a writer is you have to be there for the inspiration. You have to be there for the language. And sometimes that means just sitting there <laughs> and thinking. And you have to have an understanding spouse to engage in this sort of profession because there's a lot of staring out the window. Uh, and sometimes you get maybe a couple sentences out of, you know, a day's work. And sometimes you get many, many pages. But now with kids, you know, I'm, I'm writing uh, later and later at night. Uh, sometimes, you know, from about 11 at night to about 4 in the morning. Uh, it's been, uh, that time period has seemed pretty fruitful for me. Um, and so uh, it's, it's off and on, but yeah, you're sitting down, being there for it. I also keep a messy journal, uh, not one of those sort of dear diary deals that are going to be treated as art in the future. I mean, this is truly messy images, thoughts, conversations, sketches, newspaper articles all slapped in there. I don't know where they're going or if they'll go anywhere, um, but I try to collect as much of that as I'm living it so that when I do go back, I'll have some record of what occurred there. And, and uh, so it's, it's, a messy, it's a messy procedure for me, and, and, a, and a rather slow one. It, ideas emerge slowly, I think, in the process as I have experienced it. Yeah. 
that's a good. Rob and I were talking about how nostalgic we are for grad school, and that's one of the things I, I miss is having those friends there that are, you know, will read your work and give you immediate feedback. I rely on um, some some good friends of mine uh, that uh, you know we've we've been exchanging work through the years uh, since grad school. Uh, one lives in Germany, and uh, I think that uh, we're good readers for one another because we're very different writers. He is feels like he's emotionally stilted. He blames this on being German. I don't. I think he's too hard on himself. But I and I tend to override emotion. So we balance, balance each other out a little bit that way. But I, I rely on uh, close friends to read my work. I've also um, enjoyed going to conferences and uh, at events like this and, and reading some of the work out loud just to see how audiences respond to it. And get a, this is usually in the draft phase, get a sense of how things are working or not working in the way that a, a particular audience responds. So um, that's how I, how, how I do it now. And then, of course, it helps to have a great editor. And I was really lucky with this, la this, this book that I just, just published to have a, just a fantastic editor. One of those editors you just don't think exists anymore at the commercial level, line by line, suggestions and comments. I mean, it was, it was a fantastic experience. So I've been lucky that way. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, early on, I was I was really attracted to Ed, Edward Abbey, uh, Thoreau, um, uh, Annie Dillard. Uh, also, later on, Great Plains writers as well, like uh, Mary Swander and, and uh, uh, William Lee Steed Moon and those folks. But now that I'm sort of writing for this book, I was writing out of in the midst of uh, being a parent in, in, in family life, and I didn't have the luxury of sort of traveling out there in the landscape for long periods of time that I used to have. So I've been drawn more to people who aren't necessarily thought of as nature writers, people like uh, E.B. White, who wrote about you know nature on that saltwater farm in Maine that, that he lived on. Um, but did so in the context of his personal life, or taking his young son, ba son back to that lake and connect, reconnecting to it. Or um, James Harriet, All Creatures Great and Small, has been someone who I've been reading quite a bit of lately. Uh, and also Gerald, Gerald, Gerard Jarrell, My Family and Other Animals. Anyone familiar with this book? He's a. Do you know what I'm. You, you, yeah, funny guy and um, British and was a naturalist and was involved in um, a lot of environmental activities in, in England. But again, writes about his love of insects as a boy in the context of his very peculiar family. So I've been gravitating more for those folks who are writing about nature within the context of community and family. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. There actually is a um, a book that was published by the University of Nebraska Press called the Encyclopedia of Gr the Great Plains, and it's an amazing. It's huge, and it was over ten years in the making and interdisciplinary. So it it, it talks about Great Plains writers, but also talks about uh, ecology and uh, natural history and um, you know settlement patterns and. So it's it's an amazing book. So there is something out there like that. But you're right; it would be interesting to put together a book of of terms and 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 uh, uh, information about this particular particular area, this particular region um, that might focus in particularly on on natural elements. You should do it. But that was actually one of the big struggles. Is is you know I don't come from a science background, and um, you know I had to I had to learn. And I had to go back to the sources that were both in print and those that were available at the various universities where I was at. And as a shy person, I think a lot of writers are, that was sort of hard for me to call people up and ask them about, you know, fungus. One of the books, fungus played, one of my stories, fungus played an important role. And 
we actually had a fungus expert at the University of Nebraska Omaha and I had this great conversation with him about different kinds of fungus. That is not a conversation I imagine happening when I first started becoming a writer, but I'm grateful for it. Um, but it's a constant education uh, process in educating and re-educating myself and I always feel like I'm falling short and uh, there's always more to learn. I wanted to mention too a writer you might, uh, a nature writer I've been reading, David Gesner, have you heard of him? He's an Eastern uh, writer but um, contemporary writer, it's G-E-S-S-N-E-R. He's come out with several nature books the reason I like him is that he's funny. I thought you were <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate him because, like I appreciate Ed Abbey because, you know, there's not a lot of humor, I think, sometimes in environmental and nature writing. And I think that's unfortunate. I mean, it's understandable. There's sometimes it's not, uh, you know, easy to uh, uh, laugh in the midst of, of, you know, what's going on in the environmental world right now. But I think writers like David Gesner and Ed, Ed Abbey and, you know, what I'm trying to attempt in my work, um, using humor, you know, it's about not, you know, humor is, uh, the kind of humor they practice wasn't about feeling superior uh, and making fun of something else from that place of superior, but uh, superiority, but feelings of of humility and smallness and I think that's what self-deprecating humor can remind us of and it provides some hope if you can take that that sort of tragic element that is present in the environment today and transform it into laughter it I think alleviates f some fears in people that they can't do anything so why try um, and so they're less concerned about that and they just get out and start doing work and you know whatever they can do uh, and if they can laugh at themselves in the process, uh, laugh at the at the you know at their their own failed endeavors, their incomplete endeavors, their inconsistencies, and which we all have, then maybe we'd get more people involved. So David Gesner would be another writer I I deeply admire. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, um, Robin and I were there during a time when the nonfiction program was just sort of starting up. The Writers' Workshop, I actually didn't get my MFA in the Writers' Workshop. I got in the nonfiction writers writing program, um, which is housed in the English department. The Writers Workshop didn't offer any courses in, in nonfiction, only poetry and fiction. And as E.B. White said, the nonfiction writer is always the second class citizen. It's, it seems sort of true there. But um, there, was, there were a group of dedicated literature professors who, um, for whatever reason, were drawn to the form of the personal essay, started to teach it, uh, not just uh, in literary you know, scholarly classes, but in um, writing classes. And that started to grow, and more of us started to take courses in it, and then it developed into an MFA. So one of the exciting things about being there was watching that program start from you know nothing and, and grow into a, uh, a, a, a MFA program, which is now very strong and, and big and getting bigger and getting a lot of attention. Um, and in fact, that's the case at, at my school, too, where the nonfiction program is inside the English department. And part of me think that's that's a good thing because um, it does require us to you talk with colleagues outside of our own our own profession and and so there were all those kind of hallway conversations among literary scholars and and creative writers that I thought were fruitful and it made me a better reader and a better teacher I think of nonfiction so that's that's what I enjoyed about it and of course in Iowa City some creative writing is just in the air and so great writers were always moving through and giving readings and it was just sort of an embarrassment of riches that way and I look back on it now and I'm amazed at some of the writers I saw and, and, and heard read during that time period. So it was, it was a very, it was a wonderful time. You know, I, I think everyone is. <laughs> um, well, I actually tried to write fiction and it was very bad fiction. 
<laughs> it was awful fiction, in fact. So, um, yeah, well, you know, actually, my friend Kurt Moody was the one that let me know it was awful. <laughs> and so that was very helpful in, in refocusing my efforts. Um, so uh, I did try some, some fiction. I'd, I'd like to go. I'm a secret fiction writer. I, I sort of do it secretly. I'm not quite ready to share it with anyone, but uh, I have thoughts about that, and about venturing into that, that area. But no, not recently. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I read a lot of fiction, and I learn a lot of, I mean, nonfiction writers, as you know, in creative nonfiction, they read very much like novels, some of these memoirs, with dialogue and character development and plot and all those things. So reading fiction, I think, is essential for any, any writer um, of nonfiction um, in, in improving their work. But, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go there anytime soon. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and I think actually this book has been written in response to that question. I mean, the first book was about traveling out again and seeking beauty elsewhere, pretty much. I mean, it comes back around to Iowa, and I do some prairie restoration work at the end of it. Um, but at that point, it wasn't at all clear I was going to live there long term. Um, but I was reconnecting to home through those those natural, you know, those huge natural landscapes. Uh, and I wanted to write this book about what you're focusing on what you're talking about. Those, those occasional moments, those accidental moments that occur closer to home in whatever context we find ourselves, whether it's urban, rural, or whatever. Um, and I think uh, children, having children has helped me appreciate that because they find those, those places, those, uh, those miraculous spots in the yard, in the backyard, around the neighborhood. But it helped me appreciate that, you know, um, Fort Dodge was a place, and this is true for all, I think a lot of places, was a place of natural beauty. I just didn't appreciate it when I was growing up there. Um, but now going back, I'm amazed at the beauty of the River Valley there, the Des Moines River Valley. There's Dolliver Park nearby. I had a family that took us there regularly, and I, I think that deeply influenced my connection to nature. I was privileged to be raised in a, in a yard that had a lot of wildlife in it, and um, I think sometimes we overlook those moments in writing about the environment. Um, that's where that environmental ethic is fostered. It's in that childhood relationship to, to nature and to pets and to other creatures, or creatures that over which we have power. We all have those stories, right, of friends that are killing the ants off with the magnifying glasses. And, you know, some of us had problems with that as a kid, and some of us had problems with other th treatments of animals. That's where it starts. And so I wanted to write this book out of that, those senses, those kinships that are closer to home in the immediate environment, more accidental and unexpected, uh, wherever we live. Thank you. I'm going to hang around over here. I'd be happy to sign any books if, if folks want them. Thank you.